you have produced 116, 120 films, prolific producer. What made you decide to take the producer head off and sit in the director's chair? That's a long therapeutic question. <laughs> um, I, the, 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 the honest answer is I was creatively dying uh, as a producer. That's the truth. I was, um, I felt like I had this goal like to get nominated for an Oscar as a kid. That was my dream. And, and when Irishman came along and I kind of achieved that goal, um, I just felt like I, the business was kind of consuming me and I was losing myself as an artist. And I was kind of searching for about a year before I decided to do this to uh, find something that could refuel me and bring me back to uh, the artist that I started as. as a, as a film school kid, and as a theater kid, and I just was kind of frustrated, and, and uh, I, I just said, you know, maybe directing will do it. I'm not sure, but if it doesn't, then I'm gonna go retire on the floor and call it a day. So I, uh, I found the script, and I was petrified, and I felt like because I, I preached for so many years to young filmmakers that if you're uncomfortable, then you're doing something right, and I think I got really comfortable as a producer. And when I chose to direct every step of the way, every phase of, of the process, I was uncomfortable. So I felt like maybe I was in the right place. And when I got to the set and, and got to pre-production, I really felt like I found my, my place again in the community. So that, that's what drove me to it. So I said one question, I asked two for, for Randall. Uh, what a year to pick to direct. Yeah. Congratulations. Uplifting, uplifting. <laughs> what was 2021 and 2020 like? Your directorial debut, but you have everything in the world as an adversary to your final creation. What was that like? I mean, it was, you know, I felt like God was testing me to make sure I wanted to direct. Like, he's like, okay, let me straighten you out of here. If you really want to direct, here's a worldwide pandemic. Here's a $2 million overage on your budget. We're just going to screw you up every which way. And, and that's kind of what happened. And I just persevered and I had such an incredible cast by my side and I felt like, you know, I've made a lot of movies with a lot of problems and I think I was prepared for that. I don't think I was prepared for a pandemic, but I was prepared for everything else. And uh, I don't know, I just, I, you know, the passion was back for me and, and the fire was back and I just was never, I, there was no version of me quitting or, or giving up. And I don't think a lot of filmmakers, a lot of producers would have thrown the towel financially just because we were getting destroyed. You know, shut down, start again, shut down, testing. You know, we didn't even know when we when we shut down and we came back, we didn't even know what protocols meant. We didn't even know what testing meant. It was it was crazy, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we weren't prepared for. So there was a lot of things that I had to face as a producer and a director, but um, I just love the, the, the creative process so much now that you know producing my company will continue to do that and make great films, hopefully. But as a director, that's really where my heart is at. So, Lucas Haas, uh, prolific career. You have been in, yeah, come on. Let's... <laughs> you have played so many different roles, you haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to play the villain, necessarily. Uh, in fact, I was thinking today, like, what else have you played? Uh, Pen from Brick comes to mind. Amazing film, come on. Why this role? What interested you in joining the cast and playing a serial killer? It's funny, actually. You know, my manager, first, he actually, Chuck, he sent me the script. He didn't tell me anything about it. All he said was, read this script for me, because I need you to read it for me. And tell me what's the best role in the script. So I read it, and I was like, after I read it, I'm like, well, the serial killer is the best role. <laughs> it's like, well, they're offering you the serial killer. <laughs> I'm like, I guess I gotta take it. I mean, it's a great, great role. You know, there's so much to it. There's a lot of dynamics. And um, there's, you know, there's kind of his good side. And I mean, I, I guess not a good side, but from his perspective, you know. So it was just a really fun role to play in a lot of ways, a really difficult role to play in a lot of ways, and Randall gave me so much room to kind of explore it, and, uh, and um, I'm very happy that I, that I took it. 
So I told you I have so many questions. So thank you. Uh, how do you, as an actor, vastly, because I think it's, a, it's, it's really well portrayed, because there is that dichotomy, like you are a, a hardcore evil person, serial killer, but then you have that family life at the same time. And as an actor, you're switching between, vacillating between those two spaces. What was that like? So for me, you know, the dark stuff is so hard to, to really like grasp. Uh, so the way I did it was just pretend like it didn't exist. You know, I just normalized it to myself, you know, cause that's, I think that's what a serial killer does. You know, so there's not much of a switch. He thinks that it's all just part of his life and he's normalized it for himself. So that was kind of my angle was just, uh, that's why you can go from sort of being in the box with these girls and then his daughter's there. It's like all just regular to him. Uh, if you can pass that, yeah, we only have a couple. You're uh, saying it's regular, I think it's terrifying. It's <laughs> <what> it is. <laughs> So, Caitlin, uh, just before I ask you a question, who has seen uh, Dwight in Shining Army? Anybody? All right, well, I certainly have. Uh, you were used to playing badass warrior princess. Uh, fantastic series. What was it like finding that vulnerability to play the character you did in this film? I think that, well, I was immediately drawn to this project just based off the sides that I got from my audition. It was the, the heart of the kidnapped material is what I really got to play around with. And then after I flew to Puerto Rico for the first time filming, talking to Randall in his makeshift Puerto Rico office, he really opened up to me in one of our first conversations about how passionate he was about this story and giving a voice to these voiceless girls and so many stories that we haven't heard about of real instances like this where girls have gone missing. And there's that great line that Megan says about if no one's looking for you, are you really missing? And that passion that he had for our story gave me so much motivation just immensely to really dive into those scenes with Lucas and develop that comfortableness off screen that we could really tap into the, the grit and the intensity of those moments. And I felt like, I mean, unfortunately, there are so many instances that things like this have happened. I just really wanted to do those stories that we may not have heard about justice. So uh, you, you well, acted well beyond your age, if I can say. Uh, just fantastic. Where are you drawing your experiences from when you're finding your characters? That's a really interesting question. It's something, growing up as a kid in the entertainment industry, Lucas and I actually shared a lot of these conversations. And I, I haven't had experiences like this, and especially in something of a role like this, but really diving into the material and then getting to work alongside a fantastic ensemble of actors. We had an amazing cast and an amazing crew and just working in the intensity of the global pandemic brought us so closely together to get to create these stories in our minds and developing that chemistry with one another to explore and grow within these roles and to try things out. And I think with Randall's guidance and allowing us to explore the vulnerability of these scenes, like you said, it, it really helped fill those holes for me. Uh, Kathleen, if we can pass the mic to you. Uh, I heard from both Randall and Tim that you had a pretty amazing audition. Uh, why don't you talk us through what that audition process was like and then receiving that phone call that you received the role? Uh, wow, well, I haven't thought about that in a while because it was so, um, the audition was super intense. I auditioned for initially to play Heather, which is her sister was like being trafficked um, and then I I was like you know what I also kind of want to do this one so can I do you mind if I, if I do that I did it first with an accent they didn't want the accent and they're like well you're from Florida right and I was like yeah but I'm from Miami like it's a different accent you know we don't have the same accent so like well just just talk like yourself so I did it um, and the guy who was because I have to like drop to the floor like he's choking me and the guy like her assistant, the casting director's assistant, he dropped his, his stuff. I was like, oh my god. And then I got a call from Randall like a week later, and he was like, you are gonna make my life so freaking easy. You're in, you got it. So it was awesome, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> so after having that, that wonderful experience, does that embolden you to, to try out more things, to go to more auditions? I mean, it has to be a huge confidence booster. Yeah. 
I've done a lot of independent films, and I've started a few, but this was like my first big studio film, and um, since then I've done a few more landscape films, which has like been such a blessing, but um, this was the first time that I played something so edgy, like she's like, she's technically an underage call girl, you know, so um, I really wanted to make her just super innocent, super pure, and it's really the turning point of the film because that's when we see Lucas, like, who, and who he really is. So it was, it was awesome, and yeah, it's really inspired me to do more. Fantastic. Alan, this was your first script, if I'm not mistaken. Well, or at least the first produced script. Yeah. Big, big difference between them. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it has to feel pretty good to be sitting here in the audience and seeing it on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. So talk us through just that, when the genesis of the, the script and then realizing it and seeing it on the screen for the first time. Yeah, so um, 2004, uh, the FBI started something called the Highway Serial Killer Initiative. Uh, they kept it secret for five years. The genesis for the FBI was that um, they started to discover that there was hundreds if not thousands of Jane Doe's turning up in close proximity to uh, major highway systems in the United States, um, uh, epidemic, and um, they were put two and two together that long haul truck drivers were a part of that problem. And midnight in the switchgrass basically was almost like an origin story of that initiative. Um, there really was seven um, cases that were pinned together by the joint kind of jurisdiction of a local cop, a state cop, a federal agent. And um, so it kind of was our um, origin story for a very real initiative that went on to um, Bring a lot of justice to a lot of um, cold, cold cases. And again, Megan's um, line of if uh, no one's looking for you, you're not really missing was kind of a little bit of our rallying cry for that. And if you're not, you know, standing in front of a white picket fence holding a picture saying, Has anybody seen my daughter? You know, nobody was really, really looking. So, that was kind of the genesis of, of the idea um, and, you know, working with Tim and Randall and, and the whole team to kind of develop it into this version, something that could be um, enjoyed and, and easily consumed, but also kind of shine a light on the fact that um, nobody was really, you know, paying much attention to people that were disappearing um, from truck stops or other places that quote unquote, living a high risk lifestyle. And we, you know, Randall and I spent a lot of time talking about the fact that nobody really chooses to wake up one day and say, I wanna be a truck stop prostitute. And so um, they just kind of marginalized. And, you know, we had a lot of uh, conversations in the middle of the night. You, you, you'll never imagine getting a phone call from, you know, your wonderful director saying, all right, so, what are we really thinking about this box in the middle of a barn right now? And we you know, spent 30 minutes having a very, you know, rational conversation. And at the end of it, it's like, man, it's like, you had a really sick and twisted mind, you know, that hangs up. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of those, and Randall, Randall talked to talk to a lot of these, these conversations in the middle of the night, um, a lot of them ended with, you've got a really sick and twisted mind. So, so that's your first project that's made it to the screen. What was that like? just seeing it come to life. It's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing to have these, these, these wonderful artists involved with it. And, and Randall has such a tremendous amount of experience that it wouldn't have happened if he didn't have so much experience because we're, we're March, we started filming, there was 100 cases of COVID in the United States. And you know, 10 days later, it shut down. Um, tried again in July, two weeks, it gets shut down. And if it wasn't for you know Randall's immense experience in the industry, wonderful producing partners like him, it, it would have it, it would have gotten started again. So tremendous, uh, you know. I love it. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it on screen, so I'm still trying to formulate you know uh, an answer to your initial question. <laughs> 
I'll get back to you. <laughs> so Tim, uh, you have worked with Randall for many years, and, and Randall, I'll actually include you in this question as well. Uh, you've seen a lot of things, ups and downs of God knows how many productions, but you've never seen a pandemic before. Uh, right. That is a, a just a, a new paradigm that no one in the film industry has ever had to deal with before. Um, what was that like? Was it just sheer panic? I mean, you were a, a week and a half into shooting and it's like, nope, you're stopping. How do you pick the pieces back up? Panic, terror, uncertainty. I mean, there's, there's no way to describe it. I mean, here I am producing my mentor's first feature as a director and it shuts down and there's nothing that I can do there's nothing that he can do there's nothing that anybody can do to prevent this from happening all I want to do is to propel his vision and his career forward and it just ended it just ended and there was no future in sight there's nothing that we could do. It was heartbreaking for everybody involved. The, that was, I, I mean, this is God's honesty. Holy shit, Tim. I mean, I want to jump out the window right now. <laughs> but, it, it was done, but, but shit, we got out of it. Except that Randall Emmett was producing and directing this fucking movie. And it was going to fucking happen. So we went back to Puerto Rico. And it didn't fucking happen. And then Randall had this crazy idea of shooting it in Santa Ynez. And it fucking happened. It was all Randall. There's this famous quote from Avi Lerner, who he worked with for a long time. And it says something like, if you close the door, he'll come through the window. If you shut the window, he'll come through the chimney. And you know what? He came through the chimney. <laughs> and we lit a fire, I think. I don't know, I think that's, that's amazing. So, in, in producing, you know, you get insurance, uh, there's a thing called negative pickup, uh, there's also a thing called a force majeure. And if right. there was ever an act of God, and if there was ever an act of God, I think the insurance companies probably had a way to say, like, yeah, pandemic, probably <coughs> act of God. So, you guys got absolutely screwed, if I can say that. Yeah, um, the insurance so companies did not account for this. So, the, and I'll ask Randall this too, like, how do you go back to your investors and be like, yeah, pandemic. I need more money. I need more, more time. Like, how, how do you? No one's ever had this experience before at this level. Like, how do you, you approach that, Randall? It's like flashback tragedy. <laughs> um, Trauma in real time. I mean, look, we, we were never, nobody was ready for this. Nobody in the world was ready for this. No human in any business was ready for this. So when it happened, you know, first we were in denial of all of us because we we're getting on a plane. We're like, oh, you know, the safe thing is to go home. We're going to go back to LA. We're going to hang out for a few weeks. And then we're going to go back and film. We didn't know that the world would collapse completely. So the insurance companies, of course, they all bailed. I mean, there's there's no pandemic uh, clause. So we're out left to dry, hang out to dry. And, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, we just had to raise more money. It was horrible. I mean, it was horrible on every level. Um, but experience. Uh, I thought I knew everything. You know, 120 some movies, I thought I'd seen it all, and this was a new one. Um, so I think it made me a better producer. Uh, it made, I think, us as a group bonded at a level that I don't think we would have, I mean, I felt like we were shooting a TV series. I mean, we started and went home for a few months, then came back, went home for a few months, came back. I was like, we're on season eight, we only shot like eight days at that point. So, I mean, we knew the characters, like, you know, we could have done a prequel and a sequel, but um, I, it was it was really tough. It was, I mean, I'm laughing today because we're on the backside of it now, but but we weren't laughing. I wasn't laughing then, no, none of my partners were laughing. It was, it was a really hard time. It was a hard time for the world 
is first you're concerned about health and your family and, and, and friends just being okay. Um, once you get through that part, then, then you start saying, how do we go back to work? And I started getting really angry that our business wasn't uh, moving fast enough. And then I started threatening the unions. Not a good thing, don't do it. I don't <laughs> encourage this. They're more powerful than I am and trickier. But I just felt like I'm gonna go to the press and I'm gonna start telling them that we're ready to go back to work. So were a lot of other people. I mean, people who were crew, you know, PAs and, and grips and electrics, these people couldn't pay their bills. And they're calling me, somebody who's provided such a livelihood for so long, um, asking me when can we go back to work and I didn't have an answer. It's the first time in my life I couldn't do anything. I felt paralyzed. And um, so I went to the trades and I said, look, we're ready to go back to work. Why aren't there protocols in place? Like there are people willing to put masks on, to put gloves on, to test and, and go back to work and figure it out. And so I think about 30 or 45 days from that article, they put out a protocol a booklet and we started going back to work. But yeah, it, it was brutal. And the first six months of the pandemic going back to work was like going to outer space. I mean, I'm trying to direct Lucas or Caitlin, and they've got masks and shields. I can't see them. I don't know if they're smiling or upset or pissed off. And I don't know anything. So it's a very, it was a very new world for us trying to have a creative bond. Thank God we all knew each other and we had a lot of history. But as a director and, and, and to an actor, you, you feed off one another when you're really trying to get things out of each other. And uh, it was, it's scary. It was weird because you just, you couldn't even see them until right before you roll cameras because we're all these COVID officers, you know, whippersnapping us. <laughs> Put your mask back on right now. And I was like, oh shit, sorry. And, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a crazy time, but um, I'm glad that we're able to shoot movies during this pandemic. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, Emil, if we can pass the mic down, or you got one. Okay. Um, <laughs> Prototype of so many badass portrayals of both a cop and Bruce Willis, John McClane. Uh, but your role in this film is, is very nuanced. There's that that portrayal of the family life at home. Where did you create your character, and, and how did you? Where did you dig as far as your own experiences to find that person that was actually on the screen? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, the script was fantastic. The character of Byron Crawford was very well uh, delineated by Alan. And uh, Randall and I talked a lot about how to make Byron kind of the, the flip side of, of Lucas's role. You know, he stands for everything good. And we talked about how, you know, Byron could use, um, you know, his, his faith and his religion is, is, is a source of his morality. So he's not just talking about doing the right thing on this kind of modern materialistic plane. There's a spiritual foundation for what him and also his wife stand for. You know, she's the other pillar to his personality. And I, I felt like that was, you know, that was very important to, so that his natural sense of goodness was buoyed by something greater than himself. It wasn't just like him being a nice guy and he just came from, he's just a good guy, you know? There was there was a real spiritual foundation to the role. And I think that that was something that we kind of, we explored a little bit and Alan had kind of drawn it out nicely for us to kind of, um, to tap into, you know? So you've been in many films as many of the actors on stage have, but I don't think anyone up here has ever acted Midst the pandemic and, and sort of driving off of what uh, Randall said, what was it like having to show up on set and act under those conditions? You know, uh, there's always so much more to the story that people don't know. Uh, it was an absolute, it was wild. You could make a movie about the making of this movie. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding. It was like Hearts of Darkness or something. We were, in, we were in Puerto Rico after months of being shut down, like locked in the houses and everything. And we came back and, uh, and we were ready to go. I mean, we were like two days, three days away from shooting and then a test came back and unfortunately there was, there was COVID that had happened and we had to shut down. And I remember because Randall is an avid 
very avid pickleball player, which is kind of a, it's a game kind of like tennis and ping pong. It's a weird game, but we all kind of somehow got into this fucking game. And we're on the pickleball court with Randall's parents. And we're all, we're playing high intensity pickle, pickleball. And all of a sudden, our phones start going off. And it's like the Ministry of Health or something. And we get the call that we're getting shut down. And honestly, you guys should have seen Randall. Randall's, it was like his, it was like he went into another dimension. It was like, cause, cause he was, immediately was like, well maybe, okay, maybe, maybe it was a false positive, or, or maybe we could do this and this and this. And it was like, our fates were sort of sealed while we were still in the game. I mean, it was like, it was one of those things where like the bombs are dropping and you're just like, just keep going, carry on. We were trying to keep it cool, but there was just, we realized, you know, as the, as the game progressed, and Randall, he did win the game, uh, that we were gonna shut down. And, and it, was, it was hard because we'd already been there for almost two and a half weeks. Um, and and we, had, we were just in quarantine at that point. We hadn't even begun the second leg of shooting the movie, and we didn't, we didn't actually get to shoot that second leg. We shut down for another month or two before we finished up in San Ynez. So uh, it was wild. It was, it was, it was wild. You should have been there. <laughs> you really should, I mean, unless you were there, you don't quite realize just how crazy it got. Uh, uh, Tim, I was drinking with you before uh, we did all this. Yes, you yeah. drinks too. So, uh, you start a movie with a DP, you start a movie with a, a, an idea for the, the look of the film, and it usually right. carries through the six, eight weeks of production, whatever it might be. Uh, you started with a DP, and then things shut down, and then you had to reconstitute with a different DP who didn't necessarily know what the previous look was. You still have to use the same footage. What was that like, having to pick up the pieces? There was a lot of coordination between the two of them. And luckily, they're both really good guys, and they're both very understanding, and uh, Brad, who shot the Sandy Inez portion of it, was extremely respectful of what Dwayne had done with the first week. And Dwayne, what Dwayne had done, even though he shot 25% of the movie, um, he'd set the look of the film. And Brad was very um, receptive to that and respectful of that. And he knew that in order to make a movie that was cohesive, that he had to match that look. Um, I think Randall is better to speak about this because he's the director, but it was a weird thing because, you know, Dwayne wanted to come back to the project, but he had prior commitments and he just didn't have a choice and we wanted him back. So it was this weird kind of divorce that uh, nobody wanted. But Randall, please elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. I mean, it, it was it was brutal. I, I mean, it was brutal because I spent months with Dwayne setting the look of the film, shot listing, my first feature, which I was so anxious about the technical part more than anything else because creatively I felt, I, as a producer, as somebody with a background, as a kid in acting, I just felt like with the actors, I felt really comfortable, you know, with, with the creative part of it, with the technical part of it, I really, uh, dove deep with Dwayne and spent months at Panavision and lenses and tests and I mean, we just like lived together for months. So when the movie gets shut down, we go back for a month, we get shut down again, Dwayne's like, dude, I don't know when you guys are going back. I gotta go take a job, Walking Dead, whatever. And he's like gone. And I'm like flapping in the wind and I got no TV. And it was a nightmare in the sense that when I moved into California, I had to rebuild every set. So now I have a new production designer, a new everything. I mean, it was like starting over. And I remember the first tech scout when I went to Santa Barbara to start building the sets again with a new DP. And I remember going to the tech scout and they started talking about my vision again. And I thought it was like a twilight zone. But I had already done this 47 times in Puerto Rico. I already had every set, like, this is a joke. I was so depressed that day. I think I walked uh, off the tech scout and I think Tim asked him, where are you going? I said, I need a timeout. I, I, I can't believe I'm still talking about the set. 
eight months later. So I had to reset my mind and remember that even though we're starting over, my passion and why I'm here is it, it, you know, the right reason. And I had to reset myself because it's hard. I mean, it's hard to make a movie three different times in three different places and only shoot 16 days. So it was, a, it was, it, it, it really tested me and it, and it made me realize that I love directing. I don't ever want to do it like this again. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I have PTSD from it. Um, yeah, I went and directed another movie that I'm in post on now with Robert De Niro and John Malkovich. And, and every day I was waiting for the world to end. Like literally, I'd wake up and be like, day nine? And it did shut down, down for two weeks. All right, enough. We don't need that story. All right, there's a, a little tiredness for 10 days in the middle. But anyway, we finished the movie. But the point is, like, it, it's hard. Being a director, being a first time director, and no matter how many movies I produce, there's nothing that prepared me for this experience. And I'm very, very blessed that everybody on this stage really, Lucas called me when we got home the second time, the first time, the third time. Emil called me, uh, Caitlin called me. They all would call me and say, you know, we're here for you. Don't worry, whenever you're ready, we're coming back. And, I, and that really gave me the motivation to keep going. Like when, when your actors are supporting your vision and saying, we're behind you. I know it sucks, I know you're heartbroken but we're, we're in this together. That's really what drove me to the finish line. Months and months of extra 
spread because we just kept shutting down. So I had a lot more, but seven weeks going into the initial shoot. But a traditional studio, mid-level, 40 to $50 million movie jump is 12 to 16 weeks of pre-production. Other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. So from the bad guy standpoint, believe it or not, um, Peter was kind of based off a couple of actual people. Um, one was someone who um, had a family at home and would use his, his travels for work as his kind of getaway. I was really drawn to that. Um, and so it was really kind of scary stuff. And, and it, I, I think it, um, it was the combination of a couple actual serial killers from, from the Midwest that um, were long-haul truck drivers. Um, again, not to impugn long-haul truck drivers by any special imagination, it just so happened to be that. So um, that was kind of what I focused on a lot for, for the bad guys. Um, you know, as Neil touched on from the, the law enforcement standpoint, it, it, I kind of wanted it to have the, the mirror to the bad guy, you know, so the family guy, he's got a young kid at home, you know, coming at it from the opposite side. Uh, my brother-in-law is, is a police officer, um, so I ran a lot of stuff past him and just made sure that from, you know, a big part of the story is the disconnect between jurisdictions and something's happening in one jurisdiction and they're not communicating with another. Um, and so spending time speaking with him about how that kind of, or the lack of um, appropriate flow of communication um, was a big part of it. But um, the bulk of the research was kind of spent on, on the bad guy, really, to, to kind of create that, that family man that um, flips that switch kind of type thing. That kind of does it. Sorry, I don't know if that answers the question. Or not. No, I mean, great question. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes.
Randall and I were simultaneously evaluating the script for the first time. When I loved it for the first two acts, and then the third act came around, and I was really scared to read it because it was leading up to a moment where Byron was going to save Lombardo. And I really did not want that to happen. I wanted Lombardo to not be like the damsel in distress. I wanted her to save herself. Because we are in this culture, and we have seen these stories where male figures have saved female figures. And so when Lombardo did save herself, and this is a credit to Alan as a writer, um, I was relieved, and it was kind of a breath of fresh air. And that was one of the reasons that you know, we all collectively decided to make the movie because it was the Martin story. It's not about Byron saving. <laughs> and Tracy Lee saves herself, and Miss Cooper um, helps her and doesn't just go with what, what Peter's telling her. And a big part of, of what we were going for was to tell the story. Well, the you know what we felt was something that fits well in the modern. Zeitgeist of women who say themselves, kind of as Tim said. <laughs> and just to add that, there's, there's this narrative of the women in the film saving themselves, but there's also between my character and Lombardo, there's this sense of unity and sisterhood that's forming, and her encouragement to give me that motivation to escape, I think, is something really powerful in the film. And then for me, getting to work with a, an actress like Megan, who is so established and has the power and is helping my character in these scenes just created such a sense of unity. And thank you for that, Alan, in the story. And I think if, if you don't mind me saying again to your question, I think the crime, unfortunately, is what gets people's attention. And then you try to hopefully, you know, bring them to where you want them to, to see these things, these strong, powerful women that are saving themselves. Uh, but it, in, in, in reality, it's, it's a really grimy kind of situation, what's going on, and it's, it's easy for us to turn away, I think. Um, but um, I think that was something that we talked about long and hard. It's a, a tremendous question, thank you. For sure, and I, yeah, I was just very curious just in terms of how it all fits here, because that's all that yeah, I'm gonna add to that. Um, when I booked the role, my, I called my mom, and I told her, Mom, I booked this role, and I'm playing a hooker, uh, but, and she, and she at first, you know, she's Latin, she was like, why would you want to do something like that? And I just, I took a second and I was like, you know what? It's like 800,000 women go missing in this country, this country, every single year. So I want to show at least a little bit of like how, you know, how that can be, how we can fall into that. Maybe naively, maybe unknowingly. And that they're women just like us. So we have time for one more question we're gonna wrap this up. There was something yes ma'am, go ahead. For, for the people up in the, uh, the upper decks, the question was, what serial killer were you thinking of? <laughs> well, it, as which I was kind of mentioning, I, I'm sorry, were you talking about Oh, no, just which one were you trying to channel to, you know, which one were you thinking of about this? Because there were so many that, that had targeted so many um, uh, women who were being trafficked. You know, as far as names go, um, the gentlemen's names, I'm not 100% um, sure exactly what they are, and I wouldn't want to butcher them up, but, um, that's not um, but <laughs> there's actually, like, ha half of the character is based off of a younger guy who actually was a truck driver that was traveling around with his girlfriend um, at the time, and, and all sorts of terrible things went on, but there was a gentleman from South Texas who had a, a wife and a small child, and for years and years and years, this was what he was doing. So if you're looking for exact names, I'm not gonna say them right now. <laughs> but there was, there, was, there was a combination of, of two, different, two different guys, and 
the real crazy thing is, is that uh, what, what they were, the crimes they were convicted of, one of them was convicted for like seven uh, murders, um, later confessed to over 60. And, and it's the numbers wow. are, and believe it or not, Canada has kind of gone through the same sort of situation and realization that, that these, um, kind of similar to what the FBI called it, the Highway Serial Killer Initiative. In the press release, just for a fun fact, in the press release they announced in 2009 this initiative that they, they for five years they didn't announce it because they didn't want to tip anybody off as to what was going on. Um, and in the press release it says, if you, we discovered if you want to be a serial killer, being a long haul truck driver is an excellent career choice. And it's in the FBI press release, so it's, uh, it, it's kind of nuts, but it, it did draw um, attention to much bigger issues of human trafficking and um, high, high you know, risk lifestyles, as they call it, um, just being swept under the rug. And I think the final count was over 3,000 Jane Doe's um, within you know, hundreds of yards of major highway systems in the United States, and so they're forced to start to take a look at that. Sorry, I, I don't have no, uh, that, that specific <laughs> And with that, we're wrapping out the 14th annual. We shut down just a few days before the pandemic hit. Uh, this is a, a whirlwind for us this week. We would not have this great night without the chance to hear you. So thank you guys. Uh, I invite everyone over to the box where we're closing the party is. They are selling tickets at the door if you come for the badge. We will see you next year. Thank you guys.